Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for approximately 60 of you showing up and thank you to those of you that um, put up with the fact that we don't, don't have a big enough room today. We really are trying to resolve it. Um, everybody across, I mean, there's, I've heard about 200 people classes that have a 60 person class. I've heard all kinds of different, uh, different problems. Uh, the Institute is trying to juggle, the department is certainly trying to juggle, uh, and I hope we have it resolved by Tuesday. We'll see. Uh, but, but thank you for, for putting up with this today. Uh, so I'm Russ Tedrick. It's actually nice to see, some of you I've seen only via Zoom, uh, and it's nice to see you in person. So uh, we, you do exist, and, uh, and I exist. Uh, I'm really happy to be back in the room. I think just to, even, if, even with the masks, just to be able to see people's reactions, and I, I just, I, I will teach better, I think, uh, when I can, can feel if you guys are getting it or not. Uh, let me just start with a little bit of uh, sort of course intro, right? So we're going to be talking about robotic manipulation. I'm going to tell you what I mean by manipulation, which is not obvious. Uh, you know, even if you're a robotics expert, I think people mean different things uh, when they think about manipulation. But let me just start by introducing uh, Rachel and Danny, who are going to be our TAs for the course. Uh, in fact, there's so many people that signed up that we could potentially have one more TA. We'll see if anybody, um, see, see how that plays out. But uh, yeah, Rachel and Danny are, are fantastic. You will find them to be excellent resources. Uh, <clears throat> so hopefully you'll, you'll have found the, the website. It's not too hard to remember the name, I hope. Uh, but there, we put, basically, you know, we're doing paperless and we'll, all of the information, all the guidelines, the grading rubrics, the things that I am officially giving you today, I'm giving you through the website. <clears throat> One of the big things that changed, this is the first time the course has an official number. If, it's an, if you're an undergrad and signed up as the undergrad version of the class, then it's 6.800. Uh, if you're a grad student or if you're an undergrad who wanted to take the grad version of the class, it's 6.843. Um, the amount of complexity, I think, from your perspective, I hope is very small. But from my perspective, was extremely large uh, because there's all, getting all the different symbols of can account for an AAGS, can account for an II, can account for, I think we got them all. If you have any questions about the logistics and does it count for X, Y, or Z, feel free to ask. I did my very best to get them all. Um, one of the things that it does count for, which is a big deal for me, is that it counts as a CIM for undergrads. So it's a communication intensive uh, class uh, now. Now the reason for that, if you're interested, is because um, the department is changing. We now have uh, electrical engineering, computer science, and a new fraction of the department called AI plus D, artificial intelligence and decision making. And so if we look at our total coverage of classes in the department, uh, we wanted to make sure that there were enough communication intensive classes in all of three, and there weren't yet enough in, in AI plus D, so we looked around and decided that this would be a good class since we already have a, a project that is, um, you know, I think a substantial part of the, of the class. We can use our uh, help from, from the communications department and the um, comparative media studies and writing. Laura and, Je and Nora will be helping us out on the Friday recitations. And we're basically, for undergrads taking the class as 6.800, think of it as doing a super project where we're going to do a little bit more in terms of giving you feedback on the proposal, helping to shape the technical argument that you're going to make throughout the, the actual course of the proposal, give you more feedback, and, and you know, expect a, a higher quality of presentation in the, in the final result, and you get to count it as one of your communication requirements. There's also a little bit, before we start the project, there'll be a bit of a journal club to sort of even understand what, what it looks like to have a good, uh, good paper. So I, I believe very much in how important it is to communicate uh, clearly, and I. I actually would say that uh, you know, I'm a little worried about the field right now as being kind of, it's exciting and new and everybody's publishing, but the quality is, uh, is a little bit uh, you know, in flux, let's say. So I actually think it's a great time for us to say, hey, what does it look like to have a good paper and, and uh, how, do you, how do you do an excellent piece of work in, in manipulation? So you will meet Laura and, and Nora soon. They probably stayed back because it was crowded today. Uh, so. <clears throat> I hope that all of the distinctions between 800 and 843 are carefully articulated on the website. Tried to get all, all those things right, including the slightly different grade distributions you know, from, from 843 to the 800. If you were to scroll up a little bit, you'll see there's a, you know, all of the details about, uh, you know, does it count for II, does it count for AGS? I 
try to get them all on there, okay? So if you have any questions about that, uh, by all means, just ask. But I hope it's clear, and I hope that it's minimal complexity from your perspective. I'm excited. I, I think it's a great opportunity for the class. Okay, so um, you know the base. I'm not going to spend too much of our time here on logistics, but just to put them up. So our primary means to broadcast to you um, is through Piazza. So it's you should be able to sign on automatically if you have an MIT email address. If you're registered for the course and you don't have an MIT email address, uh, we can add you, no problem. Uh, you know, officially, I'm only distributing the, the course guidelines through the website, so please do take a minute to review them. If you have any questions about anything, if anything's unclear, by all means, this is, we're ready to answer those questions now. Um, <clears throat> I've done a lot of work to try to make the lecture notes interactive. Actually, some of the, um, you know, there's some advantages to having had a, a remote Zoom year. I, I spent a lot of time making, like, interactive graphics and, and, and things that would work over Zoom. And, you know, I don't get to use all of them this year, but some of them I hope will still be uh, a useful set of tools. But in particular, particular, you'll see that the lecture notes are interactive. You can actually ask questions, kind of like a Google Doc where you can comment and everything like that. You can ask questions right on the lecture notes. And the lecture notes have interactive simulations and visualizations that I hope will, uh, will help you understand the material. That's my goal. The setup, the basic setup is we'll do, um, uh, a slightly higher cadence of smaller problem sets than I've done in the past, where we'd like to have weekly problem sets that you know just kind of keep you thinking about the course but aren't as, uh, as heavy as some of the, the previous versions. And the big focus for the course is really on the final project, where we get, we're going to try to give you, you know, a good set of, of, um, of examples to work from, but this is a chance to really explore uh, the diverse range of possible projects and manipulation. This is just to, sh to show you what that annotation tool looks like and everything. If you were to look at the course notes, and then you'll see a bunch of different features, like the the fact that you can comment in the top com on the you know in the top corner. This opens up the comments, um, and you can highlight and and add comments and the like as you as you look at the web at, at the text. Uh, we'll see. It's I think it's still a, an experiment uh, in terms of you know is that the great way to communicate. Uh, but I kind of believe that textbooks aren't going to look the same in a few years as they do today. And this is maybe my experiment in trying to go halfway there. Uh, and <clears throat> uh, let's, I'll just show you, if you click on launch in DeepNote, this is different. Some of you who have seen me before have tried CoLab. Um, I'm trying DeepNote this time. I wrote a lot of code in the last few weeks to try to make this work. Um, there's a small chance that I don't <laughs> that I missed something, or that uh, DeepNote isn't quite as, as robust or something that I, as I hoped. But let's let's hope that this works very very well. Um, uh, I think it's I hope it will be better for the class than than CoLab. And um, just to give you a quick preview of what that looks like, so if, if you were to run the notebook from the first um, from the first lecture from the first uh, chapter, then you can just run the notebook. Um, your experience will be less haphazard than mine, but I, I'm doing it halfway here. Okay, so this is now running a simulation on the cloud, you know, in deep note, and it's a fully interactive, full physics simulation, you know, that you will be able to program and everything, but it's got, um, you know, you can teleoperate and your robot in the first example, and just to prove to you that it's a full physics simulation, I will pick up the block. Oops. <laughs> Maybe I won't, because I jammed my hand into the thing, yeah. Anyhow. Oh! <laughs> I, I, I must have jammed it so hard that I knocked it sideways, and it's a planar simulation, but. Um, it's also, it's actually a full 3D simulation. I think it'll load up now uh, the 3D version as soon as I. So the fact that we can sort of do this, that we can have, um, there was a time where I was trying to put some of the software tools and make them available for class and spent a long time working with people. How do you install this? How do you install that? Nowadays, you just open a website and uh, you know, 
all of the controls and everything are just, um, you know, they're in your browser. No install whatsoever. You can just run everything remotely. Uh, you can collaborate in the notebooks in DeepNote in ways that you couldn't in Colab, but also it's just provisioned differently, and I hope I won't be chasing fires as Colab upgrades versions and stuff like this. I think, I think DeepNote will be a better solution. So I hope that works great for you, and I, I would welcome your feedback. I would actually say the fact that simulation is, has gotten so good is one of the big reasons why I think it's a great time to teach this class, is that the fact that you can actually study manipulation in simulation is a, it's a new thing. I mean, just a few years ago, people would have said, no way you can do a practical uh, experiments with manipulation. It's too, too dependent on contact mechanics, which we don't simulate well, and it's too dependent on perception, where we don't simulate cameras well. But I think between a combination of the contact simulation getting a lot better and game quality engine rendering getting good enough and people believing that you can actually train a perception system in simulated images and have it work in reality, it has closed that gap. And now that we can, now we really can uh, do real work. In fact, most of our real work on robots we do primarily in simulation and it's only at the end do we actually make sure it works and we're constantly working to close the gap, but increasingly more and more of our time uh, is spent in simulation. So it's a good time. Um, we actually do have hardware robots that look just like that. Upstairs in the room, we have a, quite a, a not, you know, not a ton, but we have a, a, quite a few of them thinking that we, because there was an early version of this course that I taught with hardware as part of the um, experiments, uh, or as a part of the, la we had labs. It was enrollment limited back then um, because of limited hardware. So we decided to not limit enrollment this time, but if people get ambitious and have good projects and want to try some things on the real hardware, we do have robotic arms upstairs ready to go. And if you convince me in simulation that you're not going to break my robot, then, uh, then uh, they are available. And this is just to show that those kind of um, simulations, they really just do run in the browser and you can embed them in your slides if you want. Uh, and uh, it is a lot of work, but I think it's a cool technology. Okay. Um, <clears throat> that's the setup. So I want to talk today about, you know, what do I mean by manipulation? What are you going to get out of the course? I want to spend just a little bit of time talking about why, uh, you know, some of the, the machinery that we will use from dynamical systems. To, and why I think it's the right machinery to span the spectrum from feedback control to perception and even task level planning. And then once we have that machinery, I'll, I'll just give you a whirlwind of the kind of things we're going to build on top of that machinery in terms of perception systems and control systems and the like, and, uh, and end with some goals for the course so you have a sense of what the roadmap is for the rest of the term. Okay, what do I mean by manipulation, right? So, Matt Mason, actually, who's one of the, you know, actually, uh, uh, yes, uh, one of Rachel's former advisors in some, in a way, um, and uh, one of the founders in the, the field. He's at Carnegie Mellon these days, uh, and Berkshire Gray. Um, he wrote a great survey paper toward robotic manipulation. It's a, you know, it's a, a fantastic uh, uh, read, referenced also in the text. Uh, but one of the things I liked that he did in that paper was he, he tried to define manipulation, which people, people don't do so carefully, right? Uh, and, but he refused to give just one definition. He gave like five, and they were all, you know, um, I won't give all of them. But he, uh, uh, he started with just manipulation refers to uh, activities performed by hands. Okay, that's sort of a, a simple one. By the way, I, feel, I felt that I had to call the, t the class robotic manipulation just so that you know, a non-roboticist who stumbled on the website didn't think we were, you know, um, trying to <laughs> affect politics or anything like this, <laughs> right? So, um, but, I, but I, in this room, we'll just say manipulation and call it good. Uh, so so Matt Mason, the, our room manip manipulation is about activities performed by hands. Uh, and he gives a series of other sort of uh, definitions, but they all kind of build up to this idea that Really, manipulation refers to an agent's control of, it, of, of its environment through selective contact. Okay, so 
some people debate about whether leg and locomotion and manipulation are the same thing, walking his legs upside down. You know, um, they do certainly have a lot in common. They don't also have different points of emphasis. Um, I'm a, originally someone who worked a lot on legged robots and I'm focusing on manipulation more these days. Um, but that is a really, uh, I think, good definition and important definition. I'd say even a defining definition, right? So compared to a lot of robotics, I mean, so our UAVs are just fantastically cool and, and, and good these days and the things that you can do with a drone is just out of this world, but maybe we haven't fully realized the dream of robotics if we're not touching the world. Um, you know, so, so making um, you know, selective contact with the world, I think, is one of the charters of robotics. And I think compared to locomotion, I'll try to say in a, in a few examples, I think compared to locomotion, the connections to perception for manipulation are much stronger, much deeper, uh, and that'll be a big topic in the course. Now, another group of people, I think, hear manipulation and think of sort of this kind of example, the one I just sort of tell the opt badly, uh, where you have you know, a robot that's just picking and placing things in the world. Um, maybe the world is simple, like a, the old way that robots were in factories. Increasingly, we're trying to, to make them work in much messier situations. Uh, but for me, I, it's very important that you come away thinking that manipulation is much more than pick and place. Okay, so there is, it is true that you can do manipulation by getting a situation where you can make what we call an enveloping grasp. You know, get your hand around and, and grab something and then roughly assume it's welded to your hand, move your robot around the way it did and, and drop it off. You've accomplished manipulation. But this is a small sliver of what humans can do with their hands and, a, and really not the, the full glory that we're trying to achieve in the, in the class. I would like much more um, to come from our systems, you know, just as a, a fun example, you know, this is a lot more than pick and place, right? Uh, and we still don't have robots that can do this, right? So I, I'm not promising that this will be like lecture four, but, um, <laughs> but this is tough stuff, right? And I mean, just even thinking about how I would simulate the string is pretty tough. The contact mechanics between those fingers and the, and the, the string, oh, the topological planning that, that we're doing here, you know, this is, this is the good stuff, okay? And I would actually think even, I mean, of course, tying your shoes is one thing that we do with our hands, but I would, um, I would argue that most of the things you do with your hands have some of the characteristics of this and don't look as much like the, you know, grab the, grab the thing, make sure it's welded to my hand and move through the world. I think we're actually, as humans, rarely doing the simple version. So one of the things that's great about manipulation is that it really does, um, if, you, if you care about AI um, and you care about and maybe believe like I do that, that um, for AI to be complete, we have to somehow embody it in the world, uh, manipulation really connects a lot of the higher level task reasoning, scene understanding problems in artificial intelligence with some of the low level dynamics and controls that I, I, I love. Uh, so I can tell that quickly in just this one example that we've, we've spent a lot of time on, which, which is a robot that can load the dishwasher. Okay, so if you just think, what would it take to program a system so that Siwan can dump whatever he wants in the sink, including some plates and some mugs and some spoons, and the robot could go from there to uh, you know, a robust system that can open and close the dishwasher, it can pull mugs and plates out of the out of the sink, put the mugs in the top rack, put the plates in the bottom rack, uh, put the silverware, you know, in the, the little slidey drawer thing that some of our dishwashers have these days, and discard anything else off to the side. Um, there's a lot going on in here. I mean, first of all, you should ask, like, what is it, why is it even setting things down on the countertop? We'll talk, we'll talk more about that later, but actually, one of the biggest reasons for that is because the hand is too clunky. It's not a very dexterous hand. So uh, it's very hard. You can't do in-hand reorientation very well with a two-finger gripper. So we end up having to set it down in order to grab it again, in order to put it down in an orientation uh, that's suitable for the dishwasher. Uh, another reason for that is that the hand is just 
big and clunky and, and it occludes all of our cameras when we stick it down into the sink. So sometimes we grab something and we just want to make sure we grabbed what we thought we grabbed. So we set it down and we move our hand away and make sure that the cameras can see it and then we can, we can finish. So to get a high level of robustness in that system, today we needed to drop things off on the countertop in order to go all the way there. Uh, we've got versions that don't have to do that, but uh, it's maybe uh, a small window into how complex the problems are. There's a lot going on in that example. There's a lot of different, let's say, maybe feedback skills in terms of uh, motion planning and control um, of how it has to open the dishwasher, how it can uh, pick things up, how it can maybe nudge things out of the corner. That's another problem. The hand is so big that if it's if there's an object down in the corner of the sink, it can't do an enveloping grasp. It has to nudge it back into the center, get its hand around it in order to pick it up. Okay. And there's some of this multi-contact, selective contact that's pretty, pretty complicated, pretty subtle. So like the hand in order to pick up a plate from a stack has to kind of slide its fingers between the plates uh, in order to do it. This is also a demonstration of how simulation and reality are increasingly close. <clears throat> and this is actually, uh, I forgot to autoplay this. This is, um, so this is roughly the same kind of simulation, but it's rendered nicely this time. So when we're working on our feedback controllers, we don't bother to send the images through a blender rendering scheme. But if we're training our perception systems, then we do the extra step of trying to make a visually uh, realistic render of the scene. And uh, it's just incredible what you can do with if, you, um, if you put all the tools together. So that's a, you know, a dexterous hand picking up the plate, but that's a simulation. Looks pretty good. To my eyes, it looks pretty darn good. There's like a few artifacts that you can see and realize it's a simulation, but it looks pretty darn good. And it's good enough to, tre to trick the deep learning systems these days. So, um, so that's, what, I guess, what matters, right? Um, <clears throat> so it's a, it's a great time. Uh, and this is a fun, I think, a fun full stack manipulation example. It's also got some task level robustness in the sense that if it's doing one task and someone comes in and antagonizes it, it's not quite the same as you know, a Boston Dynamics hockey stick, but something like that, uh, then it's smart enough to set the mug down. And you know, so it's got a whole higher level reasoning system that's thinking about what it's doing. Is it still able to do what it was trying to do? Uh, and this is just another level of complexity, which is a more AI planning level of complexity sitting on top of all the feedback control and perception and everything like that. So I really think it does a, manipulation does a beautiful job of forcing you to go up and down the entire stack. I made a ladder to say it, right? Task level planning at the high level, low level perception and control to do feedback at the low level, and it asks us to, to span that whole space. Right, in general, I think even just connecting learning and planning and reasoning systems to physics asks you to do to answer some other basic questions um, that, that we don't oft, often answer in our machine learning pipelines these days. Like, um, you know, oftentimes we're collecting data, labeling it offline, letting the, the, the servers train on the data for however long it takes, and then taking the output and running it. But really, cognition is a dynamical system, right? We're constantly, we should be talking about the way that the data enters, how do we have a constant stream of data coming in, how do we adjust our parameters? And, and I think you know, asking the questions of how does that component actually play out all the way down in the physics engine, and how do those work together, and what are the timing semantics? You know, it really begs some of the, I think, richer questions that we will be getting into as, as AI and machine learning continues to, to uh, evolve. I come from a bit of a more of a dynamics and controls perspective. So a few of you have taken underactuated with me. so. Um, so from that perspective, you know, this class is going to be different, you know, but I, but I want to make sure I, I tell you sort of what's, uh, you know, point out some of those differences, right? So I worked on humanoid robots. This is the Boston Dynamics uh, early version of the Atlas robot. This is the big clunky one that the, the new sleek one is doing all the dancing and the uh, parkour. But we trained it to, uh, we trained it, it's programmed it, I would say, to, uh, to do this, uh, 
disaster response scenario for the DARPA Robotics Challenge. And in doing that, you know, we thought a lot about planning and control, and that's, uh, you know, we talk a lot about that in Underactuated, uh, my other uh, graduate robotics class. Uh, this is just an example of the feedback control that the robot has to do as Andres and Lucas jump on the Polaris while the robot's trying to balance on one foot because that's how it had to get out of the Polaris. Okay, so there's a lot of work there about just even, you know, stability and balance and feedback control. Okay, and you might ask, you know, does that stuff matter for manipulation, right? I'm just picking up red blocks, right? Um, and it's, it's, it's a fair question, actually, but one of the first things that's different is the way that manipulation demands more from you from perception. So when we were doing perception uh, on Atlas, our perception system looked like this, right? It would kind of evaluate the world, but only in sort of a geometric way, right? So it was trying to reason about places it could step, places it couldn't step. But really, once it got sort of a physical understanding of the static world, it could do what it needed to do in order to, and, and it knew a lot about its own body. Uh, and the control system could be tuned for its own body. It, it can do a lot uh, of what it needed to do. If you look at some of the newest videos coming out from Boss Dynamics, it's, they're doing a way better job, but they're still able to do, their inner regime, you know, this is, let's say, the Atlas doing parkour or the um, Ninja Warrior style gymnastics, right? They're still evaluating the world because that's all you need to do for locomotion, for a lot of locomotion, as kind of like understanding the geometry, finding the places you can throw your feet down, right? Wh what's gonna support my weight? Think about, you know, loading the dishwasher, right? It's not as cool as doing um, parkour, but uh, it demands a lot more from your perception system and the connection between perception and control, it just demands a lot more, right? So we have to not just understand this is the, the same sort of rendered simulation of the sink. There's a bunch of mugs in there. This is the output of the perception system um, that's trying to identify places, not only that there are mugs in there, so there's a, sort of an object recognition component that, that wasn't necessary for locomotion, but there's also, you have to understand something about the context of the mug. Like there's a handle over here, the top's on this side, the bottom's on this side, right? So you could say, oh, that's only a little bit more, but it gets way more complicated than that as you go on. You know, first of all, the types of mugs you might have to experience are just way more diverse, um, right? This is just whatever mugs we found on Amazon, but that one's a cow, you know? That, there's, a, if you go to the Disney store, you find all kinds of weird ones, um, right? So how do you have that same level of understanding of what's a mug, but it has to work for all possible mugs, okay? And to do that sort of task in order to even just set the mug down in the right orientation all the time or know that you can pick it up from a handle that it will support your weight or, or that it could, you could put the handle on the peg. It demands a lot more understanding, if you will, bet you know, between the perception system and the, the lower level control system. To the point where I think, from my perspective, uh, you know, for controls, I think it really, it's the next wave of, of what controls has to do. And, um, I'll say it maybe in a little bit more dramatic fashion in a second, but. Um, oops, is that not fast forward? I don't want their advertisement, I want. Um, so I think there's still a question though. I, told, I showed Atlas balancing and you know, um, thinking about stability and control. A lot of people don't talk about feedback control and manipulation. And it's a fair question about, you know, is it really that important to do feedback control? Because people do, have some incredibly clever designs for hands that allow you to do pick and place basically with your eyes closed and get the job done, okay? So, so I think that is a viable approach to a huge class of useful manipulation, is to not worry so much about the dynamics of your mug, uh, but build a really good end effector. And I, don't, I, I think that's, it's important and, and commercially very valuable, okay? But I also think there's a lot going on. If you look at human manipulation, this is an example again from, from Matt's uh, uh, world of this is a high speed camera of somebody in a convenience store, okay? And if you watch all the little details that you, we don't even pay attention to because it's sort of subconscious, but I think when you, she sets down the dentine, it's like, oops, she missed. And there's like, there's these adjustments that are constantly happening that, that you see little sliding all the time. It's nothing like the 
and then move it around, right? It's, it's a much more dynamic process where there's constant, you know, tactile feedback, visual feedback, constant corrections. It makes us way more robust and way more diverse in our skills. You can find there's a whole bunch of examples, but you know, these kind of manipulations, the, the way people manipulate is just so different than the way robots picking up red blocks manipulate, and we have to get there. So from a feedback control perspective, it's about, you know, where Atlas, the main job was to figure out, you know, what is the state of my robot? How do I regulate the state of my robot to achieve some task? Okay. Manipulation is about, okay, I do have to move the state of my robot, but that's kind of easy, honestly. If I'm bolted to a table, it's not a big deal. Okay. But I have to somehow control everything else in the world through my actuation, and I only get to touch... I only get to control the state of the mug through my hands, with the, which is a through contact. So the, the, the challenge there is just to extend our thinking about feedback control you know, through a contact mechanics interface out into the world. It's awesome. Um, especially when I don't even know how to write down the state for some of these problems, right? So if I think about counting the links on my robot, that's easy, but if I think about you know, what is the state space of the onion as I'm chopping it? And, you know, does that, does it get bigger every time I make a cut? Does it, you know, am I supposed to be keeping track of, of every possible uh, piece of onion in order to accomplish the task? Like that, most of the things I know about control kind of just melt down, thinking about, you know, how would I do proper control of a problem like that? But it should be easy. Like that's not a hard problem. So for me, I'm super excited about bringing some of the rigorous thinking of control theory up into the challenges that are just put in our face by relatively simple manipulation systems. I don't really want to give robots sharp knives yet, but maybe next year. Uh, so we're, see we're seeing in the field, you know, more and more examples of feedback control that is really using real-time camera perceptual input in order to do even, you know, relatively simple <laughs> tasks. That wasn't part of the objective, right? But uh, um, you know, where you're where you're starting to see feedback loops being controlled through non-trivial perception interfaces, where it's really constantly monitoring the environment, making feedback corrections, um, and it's it's very good. This one in particular is using a, a type of it's a, it's a neural network that's looking at images uh, through through the camera, trying to find corresponding images in the in the new scene. Uh, we'll talk about the particular details of that when we're in the deep learning uh, perception part of the world, uh, part of the semester. But it's, um, when you do use camera feedback well, it can be incredibly robust. The same way, this is for me, this is, I know it's not as cool, but it's a, this is a little bit like, my network is lagging here, but... Um, and for me, this is a little bit like that atlas not falling down when we're jumping on the Polaris. Uh, you know, I know it's just picking up a plate, but we're going to see some, uh, you know, all kinds of variability. Uh, and the fact that it's doing this just from cameras as, a, as the primary feedback sensor, and it's doing it with all sorts of, you know, perturbations, and uh, it's a multi-contact task, uh, but it's able to be, you know, incredibly, you know, <laughs> robust despite Pete's best efforts to, to mess with it. So that's, I think, a humble example of something that I hope we see a lot more of uh, in the future. If I were to show the, the less flattering videos from the DARPA challenge, you would see you know, the, the sort of robot air balls. And uh, so you know, the robot going out to reach something and just thinking it had it in its hand, continuing the motion, falling over, those kind of uh, you know, we don't want that anymore. We want to close the loop between perception and control. And of course, reinforcement learning has come into the picture in a big way in terms of how we do these things. Uh, you can do these kind of tasks. This is an example of, of banging on the simulation with a reinforcement learning algorithm to, to accomplish the same task. And we're going we're gonna to talk through, uh, you know, how to understand RL uh, approaches, where do they fit into the spectrum in my view. I will admit up front, that I don't think it solves the whole problem. I don't think it's just a matter of getting more data or running more simulations. Or even if it was, um, 
you know, I don't think we want to be in a place where uh, programming a robot to load the dishwasher requires, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars in a, an Amazon, uh, you know, an AWS bill or something like that, where only the big companies can afford to train a system. I, I, we're already going that way in terms of like our language models and our perception models, but manipulation, this should be easy. This should totally be easy. So we should be able to have better solutions there that you can run on your computer, on your desktop. Okay. <clears throat> That's what I mean by manipulation. Yeah, please. It's, it's a great question. So um, I think some people, I would, I would say it's, it's a very natural fit at the, down, at the low level control. You could, you could imagine, um, you know, if you want these controllers that are interacting with contact forces and coming up with, you know, a policy in, in RL parlance, um, then I think there's an active debate about whether it's better to do that with a reinforcement learning technique or a model-based technique. We'll talk about both. As you go up the, the hierarchy, I think the most, um, the most fully committed people in reinforcement learning would say even task level planning you could do with reinforcement learning. Um, I don't go that high on the spectrum. I think the higher, higher you go up, I think it, it begs for something that has some level of concepts and planning that are harder to represent in the reinforcement learning. Leslie Kelbling here likes to say, you know, uh, if you want to, I, I ask you to book a flight to Paris, right? You don't have a policy to book a flight to Paris. You're able to like put that. You've never done that before. You can do. You can put together new, uh, new sequences that you've never experienced before. So I think that doesn't fit as well into the reinforcement learning paradigms that we have today. Now, there's no question that I think reinforcement learning encourages us to think about the data that's coming in. How do you make use of the data? How do you use trial and error? That's all good, and we should be doing that at every level, right? But I think. The standard RL toolkit today probably fits best in the lower level of skills. Other questions are good. That, I love the, I, I love questions. Cool. Uh, let me ask at you. So, so how many people are um, have have worked on manipulation before? Show of hands. How many in robotics before? How many people um, have done some other area of like, you know, computer vision or natural language or something and maybe it would be kind of fun if we could put that together with robotics? Okay, that's good. How about from the sort of me more mechanical side? Uh, a, few, a few mechanical engineers. All right, cool. That's good. Well, I, um, I actually, I see it as a bit of a challenge, but I love actually that, that we get a diverse group of people in here. So. Um, you know, every once in a while I'll say things that you'll, be, you'll have to just nod because you already know that, but there's someone else in the room maybe that doesn't. But I tried to do my best to, I think, hopefully always give you guys um, something new. So um, let me take a minute now to try to tell you about the sort of dynamical systems view of all that complexity. Like I, ju I just told you how complex the problem is. Right? There's task level planning, there's perception, there's control. And I really have a goal for these notes and for the class to sort of put a relatively coherent framework for all of that together. It's a big task. Um, the way I see it, systems theory, dynamical systems, is a framework that we can talk about most of those components pretty naturally. There's a few things that you kind of have to shoehorn in. But we get pretty far thinking about things as a dynamical system. OK, so we'll start modest. Um, and some of uh, people who know dynamics and control very well will be bored for five minutes. but I hope you'll see how we're going to build a framework, a toolkit of dynamical systems, thinking about even perception systems in the, through the lens of dynamics, and, uh, and get to something pretty good, I hope, by the end of the term. <coughs> so for me, um, the starting point is, I guess, 1803, if you've taken the undergrad version of it, but it's basic difference equations. So let's just think about, just remember, dust off the cobwebs of, of difference equations, and why do I want to think about even a neural network as a difference equation when I'm in this class, okay? So, um, 
general form of a simple sort of state uh, space difference equation. You might, you might start by saying, I've got some vector, a state vector x, and a state update rule equation f, and n is my time step. Okay. So, <clears throat> I mean, this is this is asking us to come. You know, when we start thinking about perception and the like, this is asking us to say something about how our perception system is evolving in time, and we're gonna we're gonna say that that's important in order to put these things together in a beautiful way. So the simplest examples of this would be, for instance, uh, just a linear system. If I just had a constant, if, a, if, this was, if x was a scalar and this was just a constant coefficient, then the way to think about this is that I can instantly do all kinds of analysis on this differential difference equation because I can simulate it. First of all, if, I, if you give me x at time 0, then I can just roll it forward. I know that x1 is just a times x0, and x to the n, more generally, is just a to the n times x0. So I can forecast far into the future very quickly because it's linear. And actually, just by having written that, I could easily ask some, answer some pretty sophisticated questions about it. Like, there's really only two things that this thing can do. It can either converge towards zero, or it can diverge towards infinity or negative infinity, or both, <laughs> uh, if that's if it is negative. But so you can answer long-term questions about stability, for instance. In this case, you can see that, for instance. If a is, let's say, strictly less than 1, then xn will go to 0 as n goes to infinity. OK. That's just dusting off the cobwebs here. But uh, my claim is that we're going we're gonna to build, we're going to complicate this, we're going to use the full form of this. And we're going to build a whole framework in the class of all the different systems, how they interact, using this as our starting point. I'll scroll over here again. OK, so now let's just make it a little bit more interesting. Let's think of it as an input-output dynamical system. So my robot isn't just evolving uh, by itself, right? It has some, I typically write it as u coming in, y coming out. The internal dynamics are still with x. Okay, so now this is my inputs, which in this case might be motor commands for the robot. Why are my outputs? For instance, my sensors could be cameras, could be joint sensors. Tactile sensors are are coming on to, uh, of their own these days. This is still my state vector, which um, in a simple case might just be, let's say, the robot joint positions and velocities. But like I said, they're, 
there'd be dragons there. If, you, if you're chopping an onion, I don't actually even know how to tell you what X is, okay? And then the, the slightly more general form of the difference equations would be something that looks like this. Now I can tell you how the state evolves. I could still simulate this if I say my current state, my current input, I'll tell you what the next state is. And my current output, so this is the standard sort of state space form. I could say that given I know what the current state of the world is and possibly the inputs, there's not always a direct connection between u and y, but then I can tell you what the sensors are gonna look like. This would be a model. Okay, but while it's a long way from xn plus one equals a of xn, you know, it, the framework still kind of holds. Now I might say that f is a full physics engine. You know, this is maybe a, a full game quality renderer or better blender sort of um, ray tracing rendering. If it's a camera, camera model, I have to like simulate photons, right? Um, it's a lot more complicated than, than what we can tend to do our closed form analysis on, but actually many of the tools from systems theory still apply. We tend to attack these things more numerically with simulations, okay, um, than we do with our pen and paper. But the same fundamental questions should be asked should be able, you should be able to give good answers. Uh, you know, sometimes the function is so complicated that it's hard to say something rigorous. But we're gonna walk that line whenever we can. Okay, so <clears throat> what is the anatomy of a manipulation system? Well, first of all, we're gonna start putting models like this together, so I kind of caricatured a robot model, okay, with, at the, with a physics engine and a renderer, um, but we can take those types of systems and put them together, right, so I can have my robot model with Y coming out here and U coming in, and maybe I write a controller, okay. And this is another dynamical system. It could even have internal state control. Okay, and I can connect these systems in a, in a block diagram, okay? And what's important is that if this is described by a difference equation and this is described by a difference equation, then the dynamics of the whole diagram is just a, another difference equation that can be derived perfectly and simulated and analyzed in the same way as we did those smaller systems. The diagram is just another difference equation system. And it gets richer and more complicated when you have these things operating at different rates or whatever, but, but it all still kind of works. We have a theory for to build up a lot of those different things. Okay, but, I, and I would say, for those of you that have taken underactuated or will take underactuated, this is sort of the view of the world for most of my controls class. In most controls classes you'll take, this is kind of the view of the world. You're given a plant or a robot and, um, and you have to design a controller, okay? But that's not gonna get us where we need to go for manipulation. There's a whole bunch more going on here for manipulation, right? So we have perception modules. Okay, so, um, and there's all kinds that we'll talk about. Yeah, please. Is the controller have access to X? So, uh, there's a bunch of different ways to answer that. I, I wrote it as Y, and, and that would imply that you probably have a filter in here. So you have a dynamic controller that's estimating X inside here. Um, in our full state feedback world, I might separate that out and say, like, put a common filter here to estimate X, or I might just cheat and give direct access to X, right? But it does, I think the, the view I like best of control is that this is really reading the raw sensors 
it's doing any internal dynamics it needs to keep track and, and estimate, and, and it need not always estimate the full state. And then that it becomes important to manipulation because, you know, what's the state of my shirt? Like if I need to estimate the full state of my shirt in order to button my shirt, I'm kind of a bad, bad way to go. So that's a great question, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. <clears throat> so perception modules, there's all, we're gonna talk about um, two different flavors of perception. Right, we're gonna talk about some more geometric perception. That was dramatic. Oh, is that, yeah, no worries. <laughs> and, and lighting changes are, are hell on a perception system. <laughs> That's what always happens is you get your robot working perfectly and then there, someone says, oh, I'm gonna bring a camera and we're gonna take some beautiful footage of your robot doing it, right? And then they like put a spotlight on it and your perception system doesn't work. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, it happens more than you'd think. Uh, okay, so um, so we're going to talk about some geometric perception. So uh, you know, there's different kind of sensor models. So we could have just our RGB sensor, which might take somehow the state of the world, which we'll I'll, I'll talk about more in a minute. But talk about our state of the world and output, for instance, an RGB image. Red, green, and blue being a standard color space, but just some, you know, some standard photograph image. Maybe that's the sensor that's coming out. And I might want to build a perception system that, for instance, I don't know, estimates the position of the mug in the scene, right? So I might go from, uh, from an RGB image to the pose of the mug which implies that I already knew there was a mug in the scene, which is a fragility, but um, you know, I could do a pose estimator here. And we'll talk about ways to do that. One way to do that would be a, to do, use a big convolutional neural network. If you're doing a standard feed-forward neural network, then this is sort of the simplest form of a dynamical system where I really just have y of n is some function g of u of n. I don't even have any state. Often in manipulation, you need to do better than that. That can maybe work for, you know, finding cats on Flickr, but um, you know, in in manipulation, you often need to like gather new information or take multiple camera images in order to build up your understanding of the scene. If I have to look around my computer to see what's behind it, right? It might be that I need a richer. I can't just make all my decisions based on the current input the current image coming out of my camera. So that's where we get into people using, for instance, recurrent neural networks. Which really do snap right into the dynamical systems view of the world. Where they are, they are perfectly described by difference equations. We're also going to talk about um, less deep, more geometric approaches to perception. One of the great advances in robotics in the last, I don't know, 12 years or something, was the depth camera. Right? The fact that we can uh, have something that looks roughly in the form factor of a camera, but give not only RGB values at every pixel, but also a depth estimate at every pixel. They do it from various technologies, whether it's shining a 
a dot pattern or having multiple cameras or, or there's a various different ways that we'll talk about when we get to perception. But a lot of times, you can, we will, our robots will have depth cameras. state of the world in and outputs an RGB D image where you have an extra channel for depth and you might have a system we will build up systems that take RGB D plus camera pose so you have an estimate of where your camera is in the world and you have potentially many RGB D cameras you can make a point cloud reconstruction of the world. It might have history. It might take a history of those, and so it have internal state, or it might be a one-shot system, depending how many cameras you have. And then it can come out with a, a 3D point cloud, for instance. And once you have a 3D point cloud, you can put that into a neural network, and we've, we're learning more and more about um, you know, deep geometric you know, 3D perception and how do you use those in, properly in a neural network. Uh, but there's also a lot of more um, geometric direct reasonings that you, uh, algorithms that you can do. You can do point cloud registration. Plane segmentation. You can do. Um, there's a whole bunch of geometric algorithms that have relatively more maturity in terms of giving guarantees about um, performance against outliers and noise rejection and these kind of things. Okay. So I find it. I think it's very important to talk about both the geometric. We'll do a, a section on the geometric perception, and we'll do a section on the deep perception, and we'll put them next to each other and understand what's good for what. Okay. Uh, running inside this, possibly answering your question about from Y to X, right? You, you can have state estimations. If you know about Kalman filters, we'll have some state estimation kind of algorithms happening in here. Typically, they're, they're nonlinear observers, but just to, you know, to give examples, we'll build up our tools for trying to do state estimation in this class something that I sweep under the rug in my controls class, but is essential, I think, for, for doing manipulation. And this may be, you can think of it as outputting an estimate of the state. So as we go, you know, you can talk, you can have a perfectly algebraic discussion of Kalman filters and of point cloud algorithms and stuff like this. We're going to do the extra step of just saying, how does it fit into my systems framework toolkit? And we're really we'll build up an arsenal of dynamical systems that we can then assemble into a big complicated diagram and build. That's how we're going to, you know, connect all the pieces together. I think it's. Um, essential for addressing the complexity of all the different pieces uh, that we have flying around in a manipulation system for me. Okay, and we're going to be talking about planning and control algorithms. Con control definitely fits direct directly into this. You know, it's interesting to think about how a planning algorithm fits in. It gets more subtle, more complicated, okay? But I still think it's essential to think about the semantics of how your planner is going to act is going to interact with the real world clock. Okay, so maybe I have some sensors coming in, or my state estimate coming in, and I have some motion planner algorithm. Maybe it takes a long time for me to decide exactly what I'm going to how I'm going to move my robot, and I only very slowly put out an entire motion plan like a desired trajectory. Okay, so 
then you need additional semantics and additional tools to understand how I'm going to execute that trajectory in a feedback controller that takes in my current sensors x hat right and outputs my commands to my robot okay and onward and upward so you, you get the idea right I think this idea of starting with difference equations and understanding using that as the glue to put us sort of all of our pieces together is kind of the way I want to organize the diversity of topics we have in the class and make you feel like I hope you feel like you've got a pretty strong toolbox um, that you can compose lots of different systems and make them work together even at the control level there's so many choices and so many details we'll do differential inverse kinematics controllers will do force control will do impedance control those kind of ideas and they all fit into this sort of framework now as we get deeper into the rabbit hole my even my x n plus one is f of x u starts feeling inadequate so we will generalize it a little bit more Not a lot more, actually, and you get a, you get pretty far if you think about it as having x, having u. It's often very uh, useful to and meaningful to separate u that is sort of commanded by uh, by the controller versus random disturbances w. This would be disturbance inputs or random. then you can have some parameters P which could be the size of the red cube for instance or it could be the weights of my neural network Maybe they have dynamics, but the way I wrote it, maybe they are fixed over the course of a, of a simulation. Okay, and sometimes this might be a vector, just a vector of real numbers. Okay, a vector in Rn, or could be a structured data. image which you could of course vectorize but some at some point you want to start keeping a, keeping around the, the structure of the data or a motion plan is another good example okay so the, the same language holds but we're gonna take it in its full generality There's some software that we'll use with the course that, that wraps all this up into code. Okay, um, I want to make this point because so Drake is the name of the software. And one of the things it has is a way to compose and write these block diagrams. <coughs> But because of the, it uses this sort of difference equation back end, but it wants to be able to support all the different possible permutations or variations or structured data that you want in here, uh, we, tend to, we tend to wrap this up in code with something we call, we'll call that the context. You can think of as just having some, let's say, a vector x or a state x and some vector u, maybe w, 
maybe P, okay? Sorry, for my silly pseudocode, okay? But if you'll see me writing in code, you'll, you will write and I will write sometimes something that looks more like going to pass in a context, which is just the list of all the possible, even the time n might be in here, it could be time dependent. Okay, but if you see that, don't be alarmed. I'm still just talking about difference in differential equations, and we just lumped all of those into a structure. So the cool thing about having that language is that all of the fundamental questions of systems theory, and I would say maybe AI, can sort of be asked in a specific and clear way given that basic language. Right? So simulation is what we did for the linear difference equation, you know, if you, if you give me x0 and a bunch of, and my control inputs u, I use the dot for sort of a trajectory of u's, then needs, I need to compute x at some future step. That's just evolving my difference equations in time was sort of natural to do for the linear systems, but you can do it even if it's a physics engine and a renderer, okay? Planning, right, is given, one form of planning is given x0 and some objective or goal, cost function, let's say, to compute some series of u, maybe x also, that minimizes my objective or obtains my goal. Okay? You know, state estimation, it all fits. It's all just different questions to ask about the same set of difference equations. Right? State estimation says if you give me x, 0, or let's even y, 0, y, n, u, 0, and u, n, you know, estimate x hat n, or n plus 1. The off by 1 can get you sometimes. Stability analysis, verification, learning, system identification, they're all just variations of the same question. So system identification, or model learning, if you will. It's just given data of u, x, you know, estimate even if it's a neural network and you want to find the weights of P. All of these questions can be asked in a very rigorous or clear-headed way about equations that look like that. And it really shouldn't matter that much if part of my system is a neural network and part of it is a physics simulator, or the whole thing is a neural network, or any combination of the two, okay? So this, for me, is maybe the biggest reason to try to conceptualize clearly in the language of of dynamical systems, uh, the basic framework, and to build up our library, our arsenal of tools, always connecting back to that framework. Because then, you know, you have a point cloud estimation algorithm. If you throw it in this language, I can still do system identification through it if that's what I wanted. That's a particularly weird one, but but we could do it. Okay. Questions about that? About that general philosophy? W is like a random disturbance input, or any, um, 
any other random uh, input. So uh, people in reinforcement learning will do domain randomization. They'll try to change the lighting conditions on the robot or something like that. I would bring that in through W just to have clearly, because robustness analysis, for instance, would be to try to find a U and an X that works well for all W or over some expected value of W. So to be able to separate those out and ask the question clearly about what I'm trying to be robust to versus what I'm trying to allow to optimize. But in the diagram, you could actually pull them in through the same input terminal. And that's sort of the notation from robust control, but it works for, for RL. Also, as a general note, when people are asking questions, try to speak up so we can pick you up on the screen. Microphone. I should, uh, it should be my burden. I should repeat the question. Sure. But, that, but that's an awesome, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, I will repeat the question. So the question was, in that case, was what is W? Uh, yes? So um, I understand there is feedback in each electrode? Potentially, yeah. Yeah, is it like a very like channel system feedback? Just so you know, understand. I missed the middle word there. Is there what feedback? Is there like a channel system feedback? For yes. Example, can, be, can, it be, can there be feedback from uh, motion blind into perception? So each of those blocks, that's what you're going to be revealing at the block diagram level. It forces you to be explicit about what data is flowing in what directions. Does my motion planning system have to have a streaming update of the camera or not? The block diagram sort of forces you to be explicit about that. And a little bit sparing, I think, in your use of the different, uh, you know, I think it's cleaner if you don't depend on everything. But absolutely, that, that information should flow. Okay, so the, the simulation framework in Drake encourages this behavior. It's not the standard in robotics, I would say. Uh, well, certainly Drake is not the standard yet, but, uh, but uh, I would say the, the emphasis on writing out and declaring your state and declaring yourself in this sort of extra, um, you know, specific way is I'm asking more of you than what Ross, if you used Ross or something, would ask of you. But I think we get to do more pedagogical, and it's good or better for teaching, but it's also better for debugging and analysis and all of these things. It will be able to ask more uh, clear questions. In my mind, in fact, message passing systems, so for those of you that aren't um, doing robotics yet, uh, you know, oftentimes we actually run our controller and our perception system and our robot driver all on separate threads at least, maybe separate computers, and we're just talking over some network message passing interface. Okay, that's a, yet another, I would model that message passing as another system, which has like random delay and dropouts, and it's a whole bunch of complexity that if you wanna actually analyze this thing, you should embrace, right? And we, tip, we tend to sweep it under the rug and get by a lot of the times until you have to really make something work 100% of the time, and then it starts really getting you. It turns out a lot of people don't, so if there's like a simple property you would think you'd want, which is to be able to deterministically repeat your simulation, right? It's hard, it's, a lot of things, a lot of our robotics tools don't permit that, to actually get the same answer twice, right? But for teaching, I want you to get the same answer twice, <laughs> right? If I want to write a grader, I want to come out with the same answer twice. Okay, let me take it home with, um, so that is, you know, so Drake, the software you'll use, will, I. In the past, I have been a little bit shy about pushing Drake on people, and I feel the feedback I've gotten has been, at the end of the class, I wish you had just told me a little bit more about Drake so that I was an, more of an expert when it came time for my project. So we're gonna do a little bit more of sort of like explaining what's going on there. This idea of the context is one, uh, one idea behind it. But, um, you know, there's Drake roughly is three big parts. One of them is this, notion of making assembling your systems in block diagrams and writing each of the systems out with their state and their control and their disturbance inputs and the like. There's tutorials, okay. There's a, there's a physics engine which is, um, I think, you know, world class for simulating contact and the like. So you'll be able to, to do the very rich contact simulations like you saw. Uh, and then when we get to motion planning and optimization and System identification learning will be putting to use uh, some of the optimization tools that is like the third big component uh, inside Drake. So, um, you know, 
it, the, the type of notation that you will see uh, in there is it really just says, I'm going to, I'm going to make a new system. Uh, I'm going to declare my state to be some variable. I'm going to declare my dynamics to be, have some, you know, dynamics. I'm going to de declare my output. This is like, we'll, we just codify the equations that I put on the board. Okay. And it really does sort of follow the standard discrete difference equation or continuous or many mixture of the two sort of um, notation. And you can assemble big complicated diagrams. So this is actually, you know, an expandable diagram that I put in the notes, but you know, it, this is what it took to run the little teleop interface, my little silly thing where I jammed the robot into the table and it shot the brick to the left off the screen, right? That actually involved an inverse dynamics controller, a physics engine, a geometry engine for the perception for, you know, like a lot of pieces were assembled together to make that simple demo. And you're gonna be able to build on that and, and, uh, and understand it. There's nothing, it's, it's, it's open source, right? So uh, there's nothing that's hidden from you. You can choose to dig in or not. Uh, and there's sort of a commitment from me to be open source, right? So um, I think you'll see that throughout the class. Like actually, if you were to look really carefully right now at the visualization of that sliders that came down, um, the word open close gripper is truncated at grip because there was a bug in the, you know, in some, I decided to basically push open source, you know, I, I tried to push a fix upstream to like the GUI, the JavaScript GUI tool that I was using or whatever. And it's gonna take a few days for that to trickle through and for me to update my dependencies and whatever. But there's kind of like a commitment that you make when you live in the open source world to like try to make everything better every time you touch it, you know? And um, you'll see that commitment. Sometimes you'd be mad at me for that commitment maybe, but I, I do my best to try to keep this, you know, very open uh, Toyota Research Institute is, putting a ton of effort into it and keeping it open, which was a, a great thing to have accomplished. Uh, and it's all connected into the, to the notebook. So we'll, we'll, we'll see that here. So <clears throat> you'll see that, um, you know, I can, in the system's way of thinking, I can encapsulate an entire diagram and make some abstract, powerful abstraction. So the, my entire robot, which is a physics engine and a, simu a sensor simulation for a camera and a low-level controller and everything like that, you know, we bottle that up into a, you know, a bigger system called this manipulation station, but, you know, it takes in just position commands, possibly feed forward torques, gripper commands. Inside it is a whole bunch of different components that, that, um, that make that thing tick. And it outputs a lot of different outputs. Um, which were chosen because they are the same outputs that the real hardware uh, inter uh, outputs. And so there's a, an almost identical system called the manipulation station hardware interface, which presents the same inputs and outputs, except for a few cheat ports that you're allowed to have in simulation, okay? Um, but inside this system, there's just a bunch of driver code or message passing to the drivers or something like this. So you can take your big complicated perception control or whatever, train it up in simulation, pull that system out, put the robot, physical robot in effectively and, and be running immediately. So if we get you guys to the hardware, that's the way it makes it work. Okay, so I mentioned it already, you know, the schedule's online, but we're gonna go through, not only are we gonna try to build up an arsenal of components that you can put together and but I want to order it in a way that you're solving more and more complex tasks. Uh, and I, w I don't want to introduce a new technique unless it actually helps you do something cool that you couldn't do before. So we'll start off by just telling you about the hardware that we have in robotics and how we might model that a little bit. Do some basic pick and place, even with that red cube, but that'll force us to think about kinematics, differential kinematics, some basic motion planning. Um, then we'll start doing the 3D geometric perception uh, then we'll start making the scenes more cluttered and have to think about more complicated plans for grasping. How do you choose a collision-free grasp that's going to get a good um, contact with my environment? We'll make a more and more complicated system in that respect. We'll start programming some higher-level behaviors in that world. Then we'll get to um, 
deep perception. So we'll, we'll stop assuming that we know what objects are in the world and we'll have to detect objects when they happen. We'll have to segment the world into reasonable things for manipulation and build more interesting state representations of the world. We'll do some work on force control and trajectory tracking and motion planning that will allow our robots to do more dexterous things with those same, in those same kind of environments. We'll then you know, take, take some of the things that, uh, that we've already done and we can do a little better with reinforcement learning. I want to compare and contrast those with the model-based approaches. And then we'll end the term, as you guys are deep in your projects, we will end the term with a few kind of boutique lectures, if you will, of some of the, what are the what's hot in robotics right now. You know, uh, I'll give a, a lecture each on some of the hot topics. Um, and we'll, I'll take feedback even if you guys, if you, if you think, oh, I'd really love to hear about this. It's not on your list. You know, I'd say those last ones will, will do runtime decision. All right, so um, just to put that slide, same slide up again, uh, make sure you're on Piazza. Take a look at the course guidelines. Uh, take a look at the lecture notes. Run my little gooey slider, because I worked really hard on that. And uh, I'm, you know, I'm afraid no one's going to use it. And if Deep Note doesn't work for you, tell me. That's like that's the biggest uncertainty in my mind. Is like I just changed the whole back end of the class. Uh, the P set's going to be released tomorrow. There's a light P set for this week, but we're going to start our Wednesday cadence of, of problem sets and start talking about final projects. <laughs> if my intention is to fight the fight and make sure we don't have any